Bran. The moon was hidden, its light bleeding into clouds, like a wound beneath a silken bandage. Snow whirled atop windswept fields of white, gusts driving the flakes aloft over and over. The forest grew thick with hoarfrost and icicles, and between its trees, corpses kept their steadfast vigil. Under the hill, a boy awoke to the sound of a girl's breathing, fast and heavy. Hodor lit a torch in the darkness, and flickering light revealed a grim and familiar face. It had been worn by Mira Reed for... how long? Time was lost to Bran, like so much else. Day was night beneath the earth. Waking was dreaming within the tree. As he sat up, eyes adjusting to the light, he recognized the cloak in her hand. Is that... is that his? Mira nodded, beads of sweat falling from her reddened brow. It was in a tunnel, an hour north. I think it was north. Bran couldn't remember the last time she'd spoken so many words to him. That's good, isn't it? He tried to sound sure for her. Jojen is still here. He wouldn't have left without his cloak. Good? Mira let out a short breath, bitter tears welling in her eyes. Tell me, why did he leave his cloak there? Where did he go without it? Where is he? Her voice echoed through the passages. Bran shifted on his bed of furs, feeling a strain in his shoulders. She blames me. He hated seeing the pain in Mira's face. It made him think of his father, of what he'd felt for him, even before the raven came. Most like he got lost in the tunnels. There are so many, and even you get turned around in them sometimes. Now that we've got that fur, we can give it to Summer, and perhaps he can find the scent. He had tried, in Summer's skin, to track Jojen down before. But the caves did queer things to smells. Most of the tunnels held only the common odors of dirt and stone, but some reeked powerfully of night soil and rot, covering all else. Then there were the other smells, the ones he couldn't account for. In one passage, Bran was certain he'd caught the whiff of fish and salt air. In another, the stink of apples and cider. And there was one burrow where the same aroma that had always trailed Septon Shale rose up out of a deep shaft, where water trickled down into the earth. But the wolf never scented Jojen. No. Mira's eyes went to her feet. I'd rather search alone. She always said that when Bran offered his help. He guessed she didn't want anyone to see her cry. But the ravens heard. It was well and good that she should cry. She was a girl. Bran was almost a man grown. He needed to be strong. We'll find Jojen. We will, he said. He didn't know what else to say. There's more. She shook her head as if to free herself from the sorrow. Near the cloak I found. With a sidelong look into the darkness, she unwrapped the furs for Bran to see. It was a sword. A simple thing at first glance, with its hilt and scabbard and belt all black as pitch. Once Mira slid the blade from its leather, though, he could see it was much more than that. It glimmered and shone in the torchlight, a thousand smoky ripples of silver and midnight swirling from grip to point. Ice! he gasped. Yet it was not. His father's greatsword was twice as long or longer, and wide enough for three fullers, whereas this sword bore only one. Besides, he had taken his sword south, where Joffrey had killed him and stolen it. Perhaps Rob had won it back by now. There aren't many of these in the world. Mira brought the blade closer. The hilt. See? It's dragonbone. Do you know any blade with a dragonbone hilt? Bran thought back to all the stories he'd heard around the hearth at Winterfell. Aemon the Dragon Knight, maybe, he said at last. He had a sword called Dark Sister, with a shiny black hilt. He and Sansa had liked Old Nan's tales about the Dragon Knight, but Arya always wanted to hear the older ones, about girls who fought with swords. Long before the Valyrian blade had belonged to the Knight of Tears, Queen Visenya herself had wielded it in battle. Dark sister, aye. She looked down its length. And after the Dragon Knight? Who got the sword next? The stories were coming back to him. 
Haman was one of the most famous knights ever to serve the King's Guard. He had defeated Cregan Stark in a duel, helped the young dragon conquer Dorne, defended the queen in a trial by combat, died finally while protecting the king from assassin's blades. Afterward, the sword was given to... I don't know, he admitted. I do. Brendan Rivers, she said darkly. An evil man. Aegon the Fat One was his father, but he was bastard-born with no claim to the throne. So he used his magic to stir up a rebellion, and even brought a plague to Westeros, all so he could rule his hand. He killed thousands, Bran. Thousands. Bloodraven. Bran had had his suspicions ever since the Greenseer had told him his given name. I remember now. The Sorcerer's Tale was another one old man told by the hearth. Brynden Rivers was born with the god's curse, which left him as pale as the dead. Where his heart should have been, there was only a shard of ice, and so he craved the blood of his kin to warm his own. He laughed as he rained down arrows upon his brother Damon, and upon his eldest sons, a blood sacrifice on the red grass field. But he wouldn't be sated until he struck down all the younger boys as well. The final nephew proved elusive, so Rivers invited him to a great council, with promises of safe passage. As he ate the bread and salt, Brynden unsheathed his sword and beheaded him, right there in the Red Keep. He must have used that very blade in Mira's hand, Bran realized, a chill creeping down his spine. She already knew the story's ending, but he said it anyway. The king sent Bloodraven to the wall, but he deserted. Old Nan said he went to live amongst the wildlings, siring clans of cannibals and necromancers. Had he outlived his children then? His grandchildren? Just how old was he? This is all a trap, Mira spat. I see now that it always was. Bloodraven sent the Green Dreams to Jojen, and to you, to lure us here. Whatever that man has to teach you, it isn't worth the learning. She sheathed the sword. Bran, if we stay here, he'll kill me. And Hodor and Summer, he'll kill all of us. More skulls for his collection. But not you. For you, it's even worse than death. You'll be trapped in that tree with him. With no escape forever. Forever. The word was enough to frighten him. He wouldn't want to go on like that when everyone else he knew was gone. And Mira. How would it feel to still remember her, her face, her voice, as the years went by and by? A werewood will live forever, the green seer had told him. Did the trees ever forget? Could they? Had they ever wanted to? You... You want to leave? As soon as I find my brother. Come with us, Bran. We'll take you to Winterfell where your family's waiting, thinking of their missing boy. Don't you miss your mother? Your brothers, your sisters? He did desperately. But my dreams are lies, false visions, all of them tricks to bring you here for his dark magics. Don't you see it yet? False visions. He wanted more than anything to believe that's what they were, those dreams he dreamt of Rob of Grey Wind, and of his mother. We can't leave. The dead wait at the mouth of the cave. Coldhand said there was a back door, three leagues north. I'm going now to find it. Jojen might be there already. The sinkhole. The thought of it somehow made his flesh crawl. There? But it's so far. If he's lost, there are closer tunnels to check for him. We could... Today is not the day I die, Mira said as she buckled the sword belt around her waist. Bran remembered. Those were her brother's words. He said them back at Winterfell, and then again in the cave. For day, there must be daylight. Jojen's death won't find him down here. She said it like a jest without the mirth. Bran opened his mouth to speak, then stopped himself. Even before they left Winterfell... Mira had always said Jojen's green dreams were mere warnings, futures that might never come to be, and just now she had called them all lies. Yet here she was, pinning her hope upon one. 
for Jojen. Bran knew what she was feeling. He had a brother, too. He wanted to let her know he understood. To be her friend, share her pain, hold her, if it would help, even a little. But the sinkhole. He remembered the burrow he found with the trickle of water, the one to the north. The caves do queer things to smells, Bran had told himself. But deep down, he'd known there was something evil about the place. He'd turned back the moment he'd felt it. He wanted to warn her of the danger, to keep her here with him. Anything but to venture down that path. I turned back. Mira won't. I think... What is it? She looked so tired. So sad. He had to be brave. I think I know the way. Summer can lead you there. The skinny girl and the gaunt wolf found the passage just where he remembered it. He paused. Last time he hadn't stepped beyond this point, yet the stink of his urine reached him from farther in, clear as if he'd marked the whole tunnel a thousand times before. There were man smells too. Strong ones. For many men. But not Jojen. Hodor. Mira. And me. He padded forward into the tunnel's stream on the trail of his own scent. At his heels, his packmate followed with sloshing steps, fire in her paw and man-claw by her side. Out of the darkness ahead came a light wind, cold upon his wet nose. He sniffed at it, the reek of urine and men growing stronger with every step, until he caught something else. He stopped and growled, hair bristling. Keep going, Summer. On wary paws, they began again. Farther and farther they stalked, over stones and boulders, the tunnel snaking back and forth, thinning, widening, then thinning again. The water grew colder until his claws tapped against ice, a thick crust with water flowing deep beneath. It all felt familiar, sweat and fur, urine and blood, cold and death. The wolf was beginning to tire when the gloom of the tunnel finally reached an end. There within the earth was a man rock, tall as a bear. It was shaped like the moon, but black and shiny, like still water at night. The girl looked closely at the stone, then touched it. He sniffed it too, but it didn't have the smell of rock. It smelled of ash and man. Is that the door? The girl pressed her paws against the middle of the man rock, and it fell back with a groan. A hole of whiteness yawned open behind it. They padded through together. Within they found a den of ice. Frozen fangs rose up from the ground, some as high as the girl's neck. An icy cliff loomed up above them. It was very tall, higher even than the icy cliff he'd seen before. Far above, he could make out the dull light of a gray sky. The girl set her fire down and started clambering up the ice like a squirrel up a tree. He tried to follow, but only slipped. His paws were not like hers. She found holes and crevices in the ice that he could not. He sat and waited, and soon enough, she came back down, panting from exertion. The girl circled the den, walking between the ice teeth. Jojen! She howled. Jojen! A call of mourning he knew. He had lost a sister as well. And a brother. He howled with her. Then his ears pricked up. There was another howl. Her brother? No, someone else. Hodor! Jojen! The girl wailed on. She couldn't hear it. Hodor! The direwolf bared his teeth. The sound was coming from the man rock. The mouth was calling out a word. Hodor! The voice was deafening. Nothing could be heard beside it. Three leagues away, Bran opened his eyes with a start. He was shaking. But the big stable boy leaning over him had only jiggled his shoulders, with hands as gentle as he could make them. His voice was soft. So soft. Hodor. 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 When Hodor withdrew, Bran saw the singer behind him, 
perched on an outcrop of rock. She held a torch before her, a branch covered in burning moss. You must wake, Leif said. It is time for the next lesson. There was no use protesting. She had never brooked refusal. The green seer had much to teach him, she said, and little time enough. There had been so many of these lessons already that he'd lost count. He no longer needed that queer paste. He'd learned to peer into the roots of that ancient tree and glimpse the past all on his own. Many eyes of many heart trees had been his. The last hearth's thick werewood, wide as a castle gate. The sickly one in Torren Square, which moaned in the wind as if a limb were soon to fall. The gnarled and twisted Dreadfort tree, with its gashes and scars. More oft than not, though, his eyes gazed out at the godswood of his own memories. Winterfell's. He saw his family there, as they had been long ago. His father praying, Rob racing John through the water, Theon kissing a girl in the shade. He saw Vay and Poole on his solitary walks, Maester Lewin studying the leaves. He saw Hal and Jory and Beth. He even saw himself now and again, climbing through the trees on two good legs. They never heard him, no matter how he pleaded. Bran wished only to stay there with them for a day, an hour. But the gods were cruel. The dreams would always turn and change, slipping into older memories from when the tree was younger. He would see the Starks of old, the ones from the crypts, their faces flesh instead of stone. Then came men so ancient, they had no statues. So many of them were named Brandon, like him. They would visit the tree alone and with their families. He saw their prayers, their weddings, their sacrifices. Those dreams were the worst. He could always taste them. But now, as Hodor set him upon his werewood throne, Bran only thought of Mira, pouring out her grief into a frozen pit. Let me see beyond the trees today. Let me see her and hear her crying. If nothing else, someone should listen. He slipped into the roots and found himself not in the sinkhole, but in an unfamiliar werewood. At least he'd claimed a new pair of eyes. Those eyes looked out on the ocean. He was on a rocky bluff, red ivy about his roots, limbs rustling in the wind. The music of waves echoed around him, and he could feel the rush of water between his toes as the sea surged into the caves and tunnels beneath him. On the shore below stood men clad in strange armor. One by one they walked into the surf. Water crashed around them, but their march was unflinching. Soon their heads passed under the waves, and never surfaced. I saw men going into the sea, Bran told the green seer once he had returned. Did they drown? The wood creaked. When winter comes, the lakes freeze and the earth grows hard as ice. Where does the game go? The birds and the fish. The worms. Birds fly south, Bran answered. Maester Lewin had taught him that long ago. Some animals sleep in caves and holes. I don't know where fish or worms go. Do they die? The tree shook with ghostly laughter. They do not die. Deep down within the earth, the lakes, the sea, the animals find refuge from the cold. There they wait. Bran did not know what that had to do with the men he'd seen. Mira and Summer returned that night. They had not found Jojen. The sinkhole is not a way out, Mira said sullenly. It's all ice. I could make it alone, but not with Jojen. That much weight would bring a sheet crashing down. We'd fall below and die. Die? A raven squawked. The thing was hidden somewhere in the gloom around them. Die! Die! The torch soon burned out. Bran sat in the darkness and listened to Mira crying. This much he could do without the tree. The moon was hidden, a gash in the sky shrouded by clouds, steeped in light. The forest stood deathly still. Summer's pack, spare and hungry, prowled the surface for dead game. The singers in their caves below 
dreamed on tangled thrones. Beneath their blanket of snow, corpses only stirred. All seemed frozen, waiting. Bran was not a worm, he decided. The day had come to ask the green seer who he was. The singers love a villain, the withered man whispered. I, I was that. Then all those people. In the tales you killed. Half the tales are lies, said Lord Bloodraven. But no more than half. I was not the monster from the songs, yet still a monster. And all the good I did the realm was worked through evil. The kingdom needed a man who would do what others would not. If it cost one bastard's honor, the price came cheap. Bran shook his head. He tried to imagine himself raining arrows down on Rickon, or going to war against Rob, or executing Jon Snow. He couldn't do it. What good could it do the realm to kill your brothers? Your own kin? My kin. Damon. When I retrace the years, I always begin at Damon's face. I see the laugh lines on his cheeks, hear him tell me the way to hold a sword, feel him guide my arms as I draw my first bow. I loved him, and yet... His voice trailed off. Then the green seer looked at Bran, his one eye shining. Damon was his mother's son, and he knew he had the blood. Dragonfire, that was his dream, and the world's nightmare. Dragons? Bran thought of old Nan. She'd smelled them when the comet crossed the sky. He wondered what dragons smelled like. Then he thought of Osha's words. Blood and fire, boy, and nothing sweet. The world has a balance, and guardians to keep it. The old man went on after a rasping breath. The singers know this truth, and sensed in me a kindred spirit. My dark deeds brought me to the wall, but it was a song that bade me pass beyond. A melody of dreams. Green dreams. When the Lord Commander slept, the dreamer heard the music. It beckoned me for years before, at last I followed. Followed it here, to this cave. The Lord gave a wistful smile. And here I remain, watching, dreaming, guarding. From the day you were born, Brandon Stark, I have known that you could do the same, could shed your skin and join me in the trees, to preserve this earth as my apprentice. So I spun a song of root and leaf, from the very chords the singers used to call me here. My retainer did the rest. Retainer? Does he mean... Cold hands? Bloodraven cackled. His true name was Rivers, the same as mine. That curse made brothers of us, in a way. Sir Thomas was once a man, my man, my dear friend. We fought together on the red grass field that sweltering summer. We were scarce more than boys. He accompanied me to court, then into exile as one of my raven's teeth. Is he... dead? Oh yes, long so. And you brought him back? Bran saw his father's face once more. Can... will I be able to do that? No, Bran, Lord Brynden said quietly. No one ever comes back. Not truly. When Thomas died... They brought him to my side beneath the earth, and I wept. My body was as frail as winter leaves. I could not even reach out a hand to touch him. Yet as I grieved, his eyes fluttered open and met mine once more. The moment's joy soon curdled in my heart, for where death has taken root, life may never flourish. The flesh moves, the mouth speaks, but the mind is but a shadow. I have looked within him, Bran, there is naught but ash in that hearth where a fire once blazed bright. My love makes him lumber, or else it's my mourning, but the revenant is not Thomas. The breath he took came slowly to him. It is a husk with no cob beneath, the dimmest memory of a harvest long past. I can no longer recall the taste of sweet corn, nor the sound of my night's laughter. And yet my sorrow lingers still. And so does he. Corn? 
Perhaps Bran should have felt pity for the green seer. Instead, he found himself thinking of the harvest feast at Winterfell. Apples and onions, venison pies and peppered boars, beets and turnips. His mouth watered. Jojen and Mira had been there. He had sent them mutton chops and beef and barley stew. Mira had even smiled at him. Her smile was beautiful, he remembered. Then there were those queer oaths they'd spoken. I swear it by earth and water. I swear it by bronze and iron. What had that meant? Jojen thought his green dreams came from the old gods, since they foretold the future. But this god... He only peered into the past, an endless memory of what he'd lost. He couldn't see the future. He was just a sad man in a tree. Jojen, Bran said. Did you send him dreams as well? The boy from the Cranachs. A long moment passed. No. No, not him. There is power in his blood, as there was in your lord father's and your lady mother's. A star may shine bright, yet it will never be the sun. The boy is your companion, and he is welcome here. But it was you I summoned Brandon Stark, my child of bat and wolf. Only you. But... Jojen's green dreams. Bran felt dizzy. The crow! You had him come to me! You told him of the crypts! The night fort! Without his dreams, I would have never found you! There was a wheeze, then a dry cough, low and terrible. I sent Thomas to where you were, Bran. I thought you would find your way to Castle Black, but the night fort served. Know that I did not summon you to this cave lightly. I have dire need of you, and you of me. My eyes have grown dim, and my skin to bark. Soil is my bread, and my heart pumps sap. Yet someone must direct the course of man. Keep them on the straight path. Hew down the shoots that block it. It must be you, Bran. I have much and more to teach you still. If you would have me as a crow, I was, and I am. The rags I wear are still black. I am a brother of the Night's Watch. Lord Commander still, in a way. And you, my steward. For this night, and all the nights to come. Forever. When Hodor returned him to his bed, Bran did not lie down at once. Instead, he sat and thought of Jojen. He had been his friend, his first real friend, and he missed him. Mira had been so much in his thoughts that he'd forgotten how dear Jojen was to him, too. It wasn't fair. There were too many things he still wanted to ask the wise boy, the little grandfather. Too many of his stories were still unfinished. Bran wanted to hear him talk about Greywater Watch and his father Howland and the Isle of Faces and the tourney at Harrenhal. He closed his eyes, trying to picture his lost friend's face. But then a different boy was before him, five moonlit towers looming up above. Bran's eyes went wide. A boy? That was no boy. Arya! Bran yelled in recognition, but it was the murmur of a breeze. She could not hear him. Is this... now? His sister's hair was cut short, but there was no doubting it was her kneeling among the pale roots. She held a broomstick as if it were a blade. Her face was very sad. Bran shook his limbs with all his strength. The leaves swayed, but nothing else. A wound ached upon his neck. Tell me what to do, you gods. She had been crying. Help me! Bran screamed as loud as he could. It was a whisper, if that. His sister only stared at him through shiny eyes as his branches creaked in the wind. In the distance, a crow screamed. Its howl was long and deep and eerie, almost wolfish. Arya looked off into the night, startled. Slowly, her gaze returned to Bran's face. They were not alone. There was a bird somewhere nearby as well. Bran could feel it. Then it spoke. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies. But the pack survives. But there is no pack, 
she said softly. There is, Bran insisted. I'm here. His neck burned. His sister melted away, leaving no one. Beneath the blackened towers, seasons raced past, and night became day. The shield is mine, said a girl's voice, defiant. Though he could not see her, she must have been behind him. Do you have evidence it's not? The knight rode like a veilman, answered a man, stern and somber. Does your brother wish to wake the dragon? The girl laughed. From what I've read, they don't wake easy. The man walked slowly over the tree's roots. What have you read? Bran tried to turn around, but his trunk stayed firm, the wood unyielding. He could feel blood oozing painfully from his neck. He wanted to cry. He wanted his sister back. Beneath the blackened towers, seasons raced past, and day became night. To me! It was a woman with auburn hair standing before him in the gloom. Sansa? A cloak of silver and gold parted over her swollen belly. A great black shade swooped screeching to the earth. When it stood beside the woman, it wore its own cloak, all of black. Then it turned toward Bran to show a face covered in fur, with eyes as black as jet. The werewood shuddered, knocking leaves from his branches. Beneath the blackened towers, seasons raced past, and night became day. A man stood before him, silver-haired and hard-eyed. In his hand, he held a blade. Mira's blade. No, don't! Bran yelled. The wind whispered. Don't look away, a voice said. Father will know if you do. He couldn't. The silver man swung furiously at Bran's neck. A thud sounded, and Bran rustled with a spasm of pain. His roots tensed, his branches shook. He moaned in agony. His eyes wept red tears. The bright colors of the godswood melted away, and Bran found himself back in the dark of the caves. He grabbed his neck in terror, but there was no wound. It was only damp with sweat. Bran hoisted himself up crawled over to where Hodor lay snoring, and fell asleep beside him. The moon was hidden, a helmed face covered in clouds gray as stone. What secrets lay behind its visor? If it were lifted, would the light shine clear? Or beneath was there only utter blackness? The singer's eyes glowed in their holes. Bran knew them by their colors now. Scales, snowy locks, coals. They watched Bran as he lay in his alcove, as he ate, as he dressed, as he made water, as he flew at the old man as ravens, as he dreamed. Each singer had walked the earth for centuries. They should all speak the common tongue by now, Bran thought. How could they not? They watched Mira as she searched the tunnels endlessly, black sword at her belt. Ahead of her torch, they scampered away into the gloom. Long ears, quick foot, ash. The weeping echoed through the tunnels. She refused to stop, refused to accept what she must have long since known. They watched her, as they must have watched her brother. How could they not have seen where Jojen went? They watched Hodor as he rubbed his temples, moaning quietly. When he slept, sometimes he awakened with an anguished yelp and startled them. Leaf. Spots. Black knife. Hodor's headaches were getting worse. The last time Bran had worn his skin, he'd felt his pain. The pressure behind his eyes. Like there was something in his skull that needed to come up. Something deep down. I am not a worm. The giant bore the boy on his back as the direwolf led the way ahead. In summer's skin, the earthen tunnels had seemed larger. Now Bran could see how cramped the path really was. Hodor had to stoop and sometimes crawl as he squeezed through the passages, dirt and stone pressing into his broad shoulders. More than once, he had to put Bran down to fit through a narrow hole, then drag Bran through after him. As they went farther, the air grew colder drier, even bitter, as though it had somehow gone bad. The direwolf growled low in his throat the whole way, 
hackles raised along his spine. Hodor grew more anxious as well, murmuring, Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. They feel what I feel, Bran thought. The stream beneath them turned to ice. For a long while, Bran listened to the sound of it creaking beneath Hodor's boots, step after step. Then all at once, it stopped. Bran took in a breath, pulled himself up, and peeked past Hodor's shoulder. There, with his own eyes, he saw the door. The seamless stone rose to Hodor's height, a perfect circle, thick as an old tree trunk, filled by an enormous disk. And it was black, perfectly black, the deepest black, a hue so sinister it sucked the light out of the torch. It was like a great puddle of ink that flowed round and round, its blackness going on forever. Endless, ceaseless, merciless. Bran wondered at the sight. Who made this? The first men? The singers? Whoever they were, they had lived long, long ago. The door had no face, yet Bran could not help thinking of the black gate. Its mouth opened wide. He imagined being swallowed by the door, and then the long fall down the gullet of an unending night. Bran felt very cold then. He pressed himself into Hodor for warmth, racing heart against his back. Hodor shivered too and stared ahead, still unmoving. We're safe, Bran told him. Hodor, Hodor muttered, but he could not look away. Bran felt a touch of impatience. He was frozen there until Hodor recovered himself. Unless I take his body and make him move, make him obey. He wants to anyway. What difference would it make? Deep down within his mind, Hodor would just crawl and hide like... like a worm. Bren wondered what he was becoming, or what he'd already become. He thought of cold hands, walking where his old friend bit him. A useful tool, but empty. A husk. Bloodraven called himself a monster. What sort of monster controlled the dead men at the mouth of the cave? Had he started with just one? I don't. Hodor isn't. They stayed there a long while, pressed together. Shivering. Thank you, Bran finally said, for coming with me. Walder. He stiffened at the sound of his true name. Hodor? Walder took a deep breath, then he placed his huge hand against the door and gave it a push. The disc slid forward with a deep moan, and they made their way together through the black circle. The sinkhole was thick with ice. It covered the walls in a great curtain, rippling blue and white in the torchlight. A frozen waterfall, seven hundred feet in the air. Great spires of ice jutted from the snowy floor, smooth and sharp and beautiful. A thousand deaths aimed skyward. The sky. There it was, far above, a small gray patch of it no bigger than a silver stag. Bren didn't know whether the faint light behind the clouds came from the sun or from the moon but it gave him a jolt of relief to glimpse the world above again, through his own eyes. Relief, then desperation. It seemed so far away, as far away as home. Put me down, he told Walder when they reached the center of the sinkhole. He set him down gently on a patch of snow between two spires. Bran's bare hands stung with cold. I should have brought gloves. He'd taken off his winter garb back when they'd first reached the cave, only using the furs for a bedroll. It hadn't felt so cold in here in summer's skin, but he ought to have known better. Walder sat beside him and Summer huddled close, pressing his musty coat against boy and man. Their breath mingled together in the icy air. Bran's eyes traced a route up the ice. There were holds enough to form a path all the way up, but it was as Mira said. Only a small climber alone could make the perilous ascent. Walder would be too heavy, and Summer would find no grip. Bran was sure he could have made it. Once. You will never walk again. Bran felt stupid. 
Why had he come here? Summer yawned and lay down in the snow. Walder, dark bags under his eyes, rested his head on the direwolf's back. Bran snuggled up against Summer's fur, and soon his eyes drooped shut. But you will fly. A crow was gliding in circles around the sinkhole, skirting the walls of shining blue crystal. Lord Brynden? Brandon. Why did you ever bring me here? I'm stuck. There's no way out. The crow landed on the ground and looked up. Then fly. Stop saying that! I've flown! I slipped into a raven and I flew! It's not enough! I want to go home! The raven flew. You sat in a tree. Coming north was a mistake. I should have gone south to find my mother. Maybe she... and Rob... You did. They still died. They're not dead! Bran screamed, boiling over with helpless fury, tears streaming down his cheeks. You don't know that! I told you before. The answer is flying, not crying. The crow stared at Bran, its third eye black and roomy. Bran saw his own reflection in it. The crow flopped once, then looked to its right. Bran's gaze followed. They were not alone. A pair of deep blue eyes stared back at Bran. They rested in a face that was upside down. Below the eyes hung tangled red-brown hair, with a matching beard above them. The face belonged to a body impaled on a blade of ice. A gelid trail of blood clung to the corpse's side. As the crow took flight, Bran saw that the man had a companion by his side. Like the first, the other had auburn hair, and an icy spear jutted up through his chest. His head had reached the floor and cracked open. His brains had spilled out and sparkled now with frost. And next to him was another one. The third man was upright, with a spire through his back that sprouted from his throat. He hung like a puppet in a mummer's show, limbs dangling. Bran examined his face. Grim and familiar. He almost looked like Rob. But too old, and far too tired. There were dozens more. Each had fallen on his ice spike differently but they all wore the same look. Not so much fear as exhaustion, or determination. Below them, the floor of the sinkhole was a wide pool of their blood, frozen solid. Bran looked down. He was sitting right on it, the warmth of his hand melting the red ice. When he lifted it, his palm had been painted crimson. He turned and saw more bodies behind him, younger bodies. These weren't men grown, only boys, most skewered on the ice, others crushed on the floor. Others still had been torn limb from limb. There were hundreds of them. No, not hundreds. Thousands. The sinkhole was a charnel pit, housing a whole legion of boys, an army of fallen climbers. Piles upon piles of blue-eyed bodies impaled, smashed, ripped apart, preserved by the cold, weariness frozen on each face. The scene stretched out as still as winter. Bran met their stares. He looked from one boy to another, then another, and then another. He turned and turned, but they were all the same. Every one of them had his face. <laughs>